took it to uh, St. Petersburg, and then it went over to Tampa Shipyard. Okay. Want to get that on the... Taken about when? <sighs> I couldn't tell you. Whenever I got back to... Uh, must have been 43 or 44. 44, probably, 1944. Okay. When I came back into uh, San Francisco from... Okay. Even though this was when we That's were in... Okay. This was on the DuPage when we got hit in Lin, Lin Gay and Gulf in the invasion of the Philippines. It was the USS Lafayette. I don't, do you remember that one? Went on? You're not on tape now, are we? Actually, we are. Oh, we are? Okay. Uh, we're interviewing uh, Mr. Leslie Brown. It is uh, January 28th, excuse me, February 28th, 2000. In one, uh, we're interviewing at Ronkonkoma, Long Island. Uh, Mr. Brown, where were you born? Actually, I was born in, uh, I think that it was in Bayshore. It must have been Southside Hospital at that time. Mm -hmm. 1922. October, no, when was I born? Yeah, October the 10th, 1922. I presumed it was in Bayshore. I think that's what the birth certificate says. I really... One of them says Bayshore, the other says Islip, but there was no place in Islip, so I presumed it was in Bayshore. And you went to school? Went to St. John's School in Bohemia, and then from there I went to... Uh, at that time it was called Catholic High in Patchogue, and eventually became Seton Hall. That was the high school days in there. No college. From there, I went into the Merchant Marine. When was that? What year was that? 1941. I went into the Merchant Marine in 1941. Why'd you pick the Merchant Marine? I really don't know. I think at that time, my father knew somebody that was a captain on a tanker that used to come into Port Jefferson Harbor. And I re recall going over with my father to visit this fella on a tanker, which was a captain. And I guess the war was going on in Germany and Italy and every place else over in Europe. And the money was good, and I thought that would be a good place to go. So we went to the Merchant Marine, and we signed up for that. What was the, uh, the experience like, your initial training? It, it, at that time, I would say it was basically the same as uh, probably boot camp for being in the Navy. And uh, you had the morning drills, you had the morning breakfast and the lunch. And I was stationed in Hoffman Island, which was in lower New York Harbor. And they had three ships assigned to them. They had a three-masted schooner, which was the Vima. Then they had a patrol boat, which was the Kimball, which was uh, the main crew, the captain onto it, or a yeoman, whoever he was, a uh, boatswain mate, was a coast guard. And then they also had another training ship, which was a regular freighter, which they called the Empire State. And after the first month of training in Hoffman Island, I was class of 26, which they called it Section 26. And the first trip we were assigned to the three-masted schooner, it was either based in Hoffman Island or it was based at Pier 18 in Staten Island. I stayed on that maybe a month to two months and we made two trips to uh, Block Island for training. Then I was removed from uh, uh, the Vima, and I was placed on the Kimball, which was uh, a patrol boat, a Coast Guard patrol boat, and we would either ferry people to Hoffman Island, wives, daughters, sweethearts, and we would take um, food, you know, provisions over to Hoffman Island daily. I don't know how long I stayed on that, maybe a month, two months, 
and then we went, we were picked, a crew was picked to go on the Empire State. And of course then war was declared in December the 7th. The ship stayed at Pier 18, I think until the beginning of February, or maybe the middle of February, that would have been 1942. And there was a crew of the Coast Guard and they were to take the ship to um, St. Petersburg, Florida. And the remainder, they left a lot of the Merchant Marine trainees, which I happened to be one of them. I was a fireman in the fire room. And we took the ship down to um, St. Petersburg, which the Maritime had started a big training base down there. And then from there, we took the ship to uh, the Empire State over to Tampa shipyards. I really don't remember what happened to it, but I thought they were going to put guns onto it and use it as another troop transport. But what I heard from rumors and everything, that it went back to um, St. Petersburg, and it was just a, a merchant marine training ship. It was in, I guess, maybe March or April of 42, they sent us back to New York. We were discharged from the Maritime Service. And uh, the Maritime Service at that time had set us up from different crews. We were sent to uh, I, I don't remember what they called it, but I was sent to a Standard Oil Company in uh, Broad Street in New York City as, you know, as a seaman or a fireman or a water tender, whatever you wanted to call me. I received my license from the Coast Guard, and um, we were assigned tankers. And of course, at that time you had to belong to the Union, and uh, you went to the Union Hall, and uh, if there was a tanker available, you sailed onto it. I sailed on one out of, uh, I think it was out of uh, New Jersey, and we took that one to Baltimore. It was called the American Arrow. We took it to Baltimore, and they put guns onto it and got it ready for going back out to sea. In the meantime, I went back to New York, and I went on another tanker from Standard Oil Company. And we made a couple of trips up and down the coast. We used to go to Beaumont, Texas. One of the trips, we more or less at nighttime or at dusk, I <laughs> don't know how to say it, but I guess we ran into a German submarine that was surfaced. And the tanker that I was on, the Brilliant, had a a, a merch, uh, not a merch marine, a Navy gun crew onto it. It seemed odd because I just got out of the merchant marine and here I am sailing with merchant marine with a Navy gun crew. But we ended up with a gun battle and uh, I don't recall anybody getting really wounded or hurt bad on a tanker, but we sailed into um, Charleston and the next day we ended up going back down to Beaumont, Texas. And I think I made two trips on that tanker back and forth from Beaumont. At the end of that, we, my brother-in-law to be, which his name was Jimmy, we figured this is the end of it now. We don't want to go through Torpedo Alley anymore. So we both joined the Navy. <clears throat> and. I left Pier 18 from the Coast Guard or from the Merchant Marine and I went to the Navy and um, that was in Broadway, Lower Broadway. And after the physical and everything else, they sent me directly over to uh, Pier 6 in Staten Island. No boot camp, never went to boot camp for the Navy. And I still remember this day it was either the officer or the deck. I went over to Pier 6 in just civilian clothes, remembering telling me 
that this was now winter time, I guess probably March or whatever it was, go over and get a pea jacket and get a hat and get some dungarees and go down and go on a YMS, which was a Navy minesweeper. And I'd stayed on that for quite some time. In other words, I was assigned to the 3rd Naval District in, in New York. I don't remember how long I stayed on to the minesweeper. I had got my shots and this and that. Then I was sent over to Pier 92. At that time, there was the old Normandy, all the Normandy, which had had the fire and capsize. And that was um, to become a troop ship. It was the USS Lafayette. I don't remember what the AP, the AP number was on to it, but it was the AP-53, the USS Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a photo of what the troop ship would have looked like, the old, the USS Normandy, which was the USS Lafayette. We stood watch on to it, and I remember working on it as a crew, as um, these were some just photos of some of the crew. I don't know if I'm in any of them or not. I doubt if I am. This is while it was tied up? This was while it was in Pier, Pier 88 in New York City, yes. This was some of the fire damage that was done to the ship, to the Normandy, or as it was to become the troop transport, the Lafayette. This was the, the Normandy as it was on fire at Pier, Pier 88. We were assigned to Pier 92. The time that the Normandy went on fire, I think there was, I don't know the number correctly, if there was a couple of hundred Navy personnel already onto it. And, uh, After Pier 92, I guess, uh, I don't remember how long I was there. I guess it was till maybe June or July. And it looked like the Pier, the Normandy was never going to be made into a troop transport. And they sent me to Todd Erie Basin over in Brooklyn. That was another AP, the USS DuPage. I, I can't remember that. I think it was 96, if I'm not mistaken. But that was to be converted into an attack troop transport. And um, I think it was from maybe June or till September. Of, that had to be a year of 43 then, 1943. And we worked on to it as the Navy crew plus the shipyards. And they turned it into an attack troop transport. Now what exactly is an attack troop transport? That was... Uh, the A was for the auxiliary, the P was for personnel, and for the A was for an attack. And what we did with the attack troop transports, of course, they were all invasions with the LSTs and LCIs. And we used to keep uh, carry the, the Marines or the Army. Well, in fact, even at one time, we carried Air Force personnel onto it. But uh, we'd go in almost up to the beaches and then, of course, then they would launch the, the amphibious the, tack, uh, the boats and the personnel would go over onto them or we'd load the, the jeeps onto them or cannons, whatever it was, and then they would go in as waves onto the beach. That's the original one. The DuPage, if you want to go into the DuPage, it had a, a fairly good history, I says. Uh, I was on it over three years, almost four years, I put on the DuPage. We left uh, Brooklyn at Todd Airy Basin, and we went to Norfolk. I don't know what, where the other part of it, well, I originally figured it was Northport. And we picked up what they call the Higgins boats and the boat crews. <clears throat> and from there we went through the Panama Canal and then we went to San Diego. 
and we stayed in San Diego for quite a while until I guess what you would call was a, a flotilla or a division of APAs and um, we left and went to the first invasion of Kualajan in the Pacific, uh, stopping at Pearl Harbor and then going to the invasion of Kualajan. And from there it was... What was that like? I, I was... I was, of course, in fire room and engine room now, so really you didn't know what was going on much up on deck. But if I recall, there was none of our boats or anything else that was lost into it. And they would, the casualties would come back and they would go into our sick bay. Eventually they would be moved to a hospital ship or we'd take them to some other island, whatever it was. How did, how did it feel working below deck and really not knowing what's going on? I, I don't know. I guess it was, it was a different experience, I said. The, the below deck, you were always figured that, you no, know, you were going to get hit with a torpedo, in which you know, a lot of the Navy ships did, you know, take the Indianapolis and a lot of the other ones, you no, know, they got hit. And I often think, you no, know, the whole fire room, the whole engine room, and the whole as they call it, we used to be called the Black Gang. They were probably all wiped out immediately, you know. But then <clears throat> the other thing is that you always figured from the ones up on deck, they stood the other thing of air attacks and everything else. So it, it was a different story, I guess, for both, both ways, you know. Six of one, half a dozen the other. I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the, the thing, I guess, mechanically, I always, I come out of the Merchant Marine, you know, as a fireman and everything, and then uh, went into the Navy. I ended up in the same place in the fire room, too. But when we went in the Navy, I said, from uh, the Merchant Marine, you now we figured, well, boy, we get on a nice destroyer, a nice battle wagon, but we ended up back on merchant ships. But <clears throat> after, uh, Kualajan and after we ended up, the home base became, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Guadalcanal. We were there for a long while. We used to f ferry daily. I don't know why they picked on the DuPage, but maybe there were more ships. But we used to have the run from Tulagi, which was the Navy supply depot, over to Guadalcanal. Every day it was the same thing. You no, know, we'd come back night and they'd load up and the next morning we'd go back over. So T Guadalcanal became our home base in the Pacific. From there we went to New, uh, New Caledonia and we loaded up with Army personnel and from there we went to uh, Cape Gloucester and Bougainville where any invasions of both of those. And then we came back and we ended up in Guadalcanal again, which was back to home. Did you get on shore at all? We used to get, yeah, they'd, they'd let us go on Liberty at uh, Guadalcanal. And then even though they were still fighting there, we were, <coughs> we were restricted. You know, don't go this side of the river or don't go here or don't go someplace else. So we were more or less restricted. And I guess the big thing there that they used to give us two cans of beer when we went over on Liberty in any of the islands. And it was one of these things that uh, wherever we got Liberty on the islands, it was always playing baseball or basketball. We'd play baseball against this crew or that crew or the Marines that were based there. We would play it against some crew from a destroyer or something. So that was a, a relaxation. or there was no, I don't recall ever going swimming in Guadalcanal. I don't think there was anybody ever went swimming off the beaches in Guadalcanal. But after that, we went to um, the invasion of Guam. And then from Guam, we came back to, uh, I think from Guam, we went to uh, the New Hebrides. We took a lot of, uh, what was it, the wounded personnel from Guam and we went down to the New Hebrides to a, there was an army hospital down there. Then we came back 
I, I don't remember if we came back to Guadalcanal or not, but then the next big invasion was Pelilu, where uh, I think there's a book on toward hell on hell on earth or something. The Marines fought and fought. We stayed there, I think it was 21 days supplying uh, DEs with food and oil and destroyers. We fueled and supplied provisions for a couple of destroyers and a couple of... It was 21 days and then they would bring the wounded over and it seemed odd that uh, nobody would ever tell you but uh, if you were off duty that it just seemed that everybody would go and help the stretchers. You know, they'd bring them on and you bring the, bring the wounded up into their uh, sick bay, which was, we had a fairly good hospital aboard the ship. And then we would generally help them take them down and what they would do, they would use one of the, the troops quarters from the invasion, they'd use one of the troops quarters as uh, a hospital, and I recall you know, myself, you know, even though I didn't smoke, that we would call going down, lighting cigarettes for them, giving them water, or giving them candy, or bringing them something else. Down. This wasn't required duty. No, this just... no, this wasn't required. It, it, it's. I guess it just seemed like everybody did it. Nobody asked. You did it on your own. If you were off duty, of course, if you were on duty, which we were down in the fire room, but uh, if you were off duty, you know, and it had to be done, that somebody would help pick up the stretcher and take the fellas down or take them up to the sick bay. The worst one, I think, then was, um, was Pelilu. There was more Marines wounded there, I think, than in any of the other invasions. <clears throat> After Pelilu, we we were assigned to uh, MacArthur's fleet, old Douglas MacArthur, and we went down to New Guinea. We were at, I think the first place we went into was Hollandi, New Guinea. And uh, from New Guinea we loaded troops, uh, uh, the army troops, and that was our first invasion of um, the Philippines. We went into Leyte and of course as everybody know that was a big disaster as far as the Navy ships and the destroyers, all that, um, the battle out there, you know, I think it was in Sungara Straits, if not in Mindanao Straits and everything, that was where the Navy had a the big battle with the Japanese. But uh, from there, we went back to New Guinea. <clears throat> and uh, this time we went to, I guess we went back to Hollandia. Then we went back up to another reinforcement, so Lady. So that's two trips into Lady. Then we were sent as um, a lead ship back down to New Guinea to uh, a tappy, I guess it was. And there we loaded on troops and we left for the invasion of um, Luzon up through the, I guess it was the Sula Sea. I think the Mindawa Straits and through the China Sea. And uh, we went into Luzon and uh, <clears throat> that was where we uh, met our fate. We uh, got hit coming out. I think it was June the 9th that we went in on that. Must have been 1944, I guess. We got hit on coming out of there on June the 10th. We got hit by uh, a Japanese kamikaze. And there, we lost 35 of the crew. And uh, I think there was a, 
138 or 140 of them that were wounded. How big a crew total was it? I would say roughly maybe 400. And then when we had the boat crew on, of course, there was another couple of hundred for boat crew, so maybe there was probably six, 600 on, to, on the, the DuPage. But uh, the ship got hit on the port, port wing of the bridge, and then it, uh, the airplane went down the whole uh, port side mm -hmm. off to the fantail, and it wiped out the, the whole port side. It, it took out um, one deck of the Higgins boats, and um, it started fires, which raged all night long. No, and uh, when did you know you were hit? Did you immediately? Well, I we knew something happened. Of course, I had I was on watch. I had the main control panel in the, in the fire room. I was on that was my battle station. And I don't recall, I says it's so long ago, we had the two boilers lit, and I don't remember if I had two burners on both boilers lit off, or if I had one burner lit off. But uh, after we got hit, of course the bridge was, wanted more pressure on everything, that was the fire hoses. And, and I remember then we lit all three three burners off on both boilers, so uh, it it was shaky. <laughs> but uh, there was able a, to maintain pressure. And yeah, we we did pretty good. We uh, no, the pressure was good. They put the fires out. They said there was a destroyer come up on one side, and then there was a, a troop transport come up on the other side, and they sprayed the, the DuPage, you know, with water from their fire hoses. There was five, five crewmen were blown over the side. They were picked up later by a, a destroyer. But uh, there was another time that now you weren't picking up your uh, Marines, you were picking up your own crew and uh, taking them up to sick bay. The next day they brought in doctors and corpsmen from different ships to help the, the doctors and corpsmen aboard the DuPage. And uh, I don't remember where they, where we took the, the wounded. I think most of our crew went aboard hospital ships. And after we got hit, we went back to Lady. And then we stayed there, I think, two or three days, or maybe it was a week, I don't know. Then we went back up to Lungay and Gulf again to San Fabian with another crew of reinforcements. And after that, we were you know, pretty well banged up, so. We were sent back to the States for the stop at Guam and the stop at uh, Pearl Harbor. And we come back to the Alameda shipyard in uh, San Francisco. And after that, we made, I don't remember where we went. I, th I don't remember if the war was over at that time in Europe. Or I think it was, and we made a trip to uh, Okinawa. We went back out to Okinawa. Did you get caught in the typhoon? We did. We were, the typhoon was after, after, after Okinawa. Typhoon, if I remember, was when we were going into Japan. We, we came back from Okinawa, we came back to the States, and then we went to, uh, uh, our base was at that time was after Alameda Shipyard, and we went back to Okinawa. When we came back with San Francisco. So we made another trip back to the States, and then we were going back out, and we stopped at uh, Pearl Harbor, and I think we stopped at Guam. And then we were going into uh, Japan. The war was over then, and we were going into Japan. We went to a place called Wakayama while they uh, uh, cleared the mines and uh, 
we were we were going to Nagoya and Osaka, uh, Osaka. So we had to wait there, and that's when you mentioned the typhoon. I remember we were anchored, and uh, the anchors, I guess, I presume, didn't hold, and we had to get underway, and we went out, and we rode the storm out into the, I guess it was the China Sea, I really don't know where it was, but uh, we rode the storm out with uh, a couple of the other transports that went out with us. And then eventually we did, after the typhoon, eventually we did come back and we, uh, we came into uh, Osaka and then we went to Nagoya too in Japan. The war was over and uh, what did we do then? Oh, we would put on what they call the magic carpet and we'd stopped at Guam. I think we stopped at Pearl Harbor, and we came back to San Francisco again. This was bringing troops back. Bringing troops and the wounded, of course. We Every time we came back to San Francisco, we'd tie up at, I guess it was the end of Market Street. I don't know why we were always lucky to tie up at, at a pier, but we always tied up, and there was always the ambulances and the people waiting out for the, the wounded to come back. Then the ship made another trip to Guam, and uh, came back and went to uh, Portland, Oregon. And from Portland, Oregon, it came through the Panama Canal back up to New York. And it left the Navy. And it was turned over to the Maritime Service. And I think the old DuPage sailed for 27 more years as a merchant ship. After I got off it, I, I got off it in San Francisco, and uh, I was sent to uh, Treasure Island, which was in part of uh, San Francisco Bay. And then from there, we came back to this uh, to New York, and I was assigned to the Brooklyn Navy Yard before I went to Lido Beach and was finally destroyed, uh, destroyed, finally discharged. So. That about covers it. Did, uh, you said you were assigned to MacArthur's fleet. What did you think of him? Well, we didn't have nothing to do with him. I guess when you say MacArthur's fleet, it was the, the, the transports that carried the troops, MacArthur's troops, no, I shall return, and uh, that's the ones that we went back to Lady on to it. I think there's a, a pocket book or there's a pocket there's a book out onto it by, I don't know who the author is onto it, but it's, uh, the book I think is entitled MacArthur's, MacArthur's Navy, if I, I, I might be wrong onto it, but I think it was the book MacArthur's Navy, and that refers to the transports, the LSTs, everything that left from New Guinea and went up to the Philippines where, you know, his famous thing, I shall return. But I, of course, I never met him or anything. We were always a flagship. I, I don't know why the DuPage ended up as a flagship. We were always flagship for transport group this or the transport group that or the, we were the, the fifth amphibious force for a long while. And then when we did get hit in, in uh, Luzon, we were sailing out and to be the leader going out again, and that's for some unknown reason. I don't know what happened, but uh, we we went out at that time as we were getting in position when we got hit. And I don't remember if it was a Betty Bomber or a Zeke or what hit us, but uh, as I said before in the, in the beginning of it, no, it did did a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Skipper. Gee, I, I think what his name was. I think I have a picture of him in here. Was he a good skipper? Huh? Was he a oh, good yeah. skipper? Oh, uh, yeah. There he 
is Waltrip. No, we, I never, the crew was always good on to it. We, we never had no problems. And it was the same thing when we went off to the islands. No, it was always, uh, there was, uh, I don't know if you got this on there or not, but there was a congressional record of, uh, I didn't mention that before, but a congressional record in Congress for the four fellas. There was a bomb, a live bomb, that was left on the upper deck after we got hit, and four of the crewmen threw the bomb over the side that was left after mm -hmm. the airplane hit us. And then in Congress there was a, a congressional record that they got they got mentioned that uh, the four fellas did. We have reunions every year. This one's coming up in, 19, in the year 2001. It'll be in Seattle, Washington. The first one was in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. And we've had them in Massachusetts. They've been out in Salt Lake City. So almost every year there's a, a, a reunion on to them. I belong to uh, it's a New York State, uh, I haven't mentioned this, it's a New York State amphibious force, and I belong to the Long Island region. And uh, we keep in pretty good contact with all the fellas. I think there's 200 or 300 of us now into it, the Long Island Association. And we meet generally every four months, but there's no meetings, the dues are minimal. There's no secretary, and there's no reading of the minutes. And what we do, we all go out and we meet generally with the wives or girlfriends or whatever. And we generally meet in a place in Farmingdale by the Republic Airport. And we generally have a nice luncheon or dinner. And the average attendance, I think, on to has been running 100, 101, 110 people for the... Pretty impressive. Yes, it is. <laughs> more than some of the other ones get for the regular reunions. No, even our own reunions, we don't get 100 people, 110 people. Did you uh, ever cross the equator? Oh, yeah, many a times. I became, uh, what do they call it? Shellback. Huh? Shellback. Yeah, I'm a shellback, yeah. What was that uh, first time like? That was, that was a disaster. <laughs> it was one of the best, I guess, a disaster you call it, one of the best times in the ship's history. Of course, they shaved your head, and then they put the tar or whatever it was, tar or grease all over you, feathers all over you. King Neptune was sitting up there, and generally a boatswain mate, that's most of the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the first time, and of course, from then on, no, you were part of the, the shellbacks to do the initiation to the other ones. but. I don't really ever recall going across it with any troops at all, but uh, back and forth to Guadalcanal, you know, and up from Guam and everything, going down through there, you cross the equator quite a few times. You, Did know. you get a, your certificate? Yes, yes. Still have it? Oh, yes, yeah, still has it. Hangs down, <laughs> hangs down the cellar. Mm -hmm. That with, uh, I guess the other certificates hanging down there, too, on the wall is their... Uh, a commissioner of the ship, or a, a plank owner. That's oh, you're a plank right. owner? Yeah, plank owner of it, yeah, the DuPage, yeah, I was a plank owner. I would have been a plank owner, I guess, on uh, the Normandy, but of course it never did sail. Mm -hmm. It was too bad they scrapped it when they did erase it. It finally went to the scrap guards over in, in Jersey, but. Uh, things yeah. train out, you know, you, you plan on or the Navy or whoever it is, you higher ups plan on one thing and then uh, things don't turn out and then something else turns up just as just as well. You know, that we didn't sail on the big transports, but if I sailed on that I'd probably been just like the other ones at West Point and the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth sailing back and forth to Europe all the time. I never did get to Europe. I said my my duties was all in the Pacific. I said uh, 
the four years, almost the four years that I put in was all out in the Pacific. Was, uh, was the group uh, below deck pretty tight knit? We were, yeah, they were, they were, we, the fire room and engine room on, uh, that was like a C2 transport, a C2 cargo ship, the fire room and engine room, <clears throat> I would say almost combined, the, the engine room crew was one level above the fire room crew, and, uh, on liberties and everything, no. And we always got along very well. I n never knew anybody that had any problems. When we, when we got hit, I said I lost two fellas from my crew that were killed. And I think there was a fellow by the name of, of, of Fox. We used to call him Foxy. He was always seemed to be in the engine room crew when I was in the fire room gang, we always seemed to be on the same watch all the time. And I think he lost a couple of fellas on there too. So the, the thing I explained too, I, I told this to somebody else too, that there was a fella just passed away and uh, I didn't know him, but he was supposed to have been on the same ship with me. and. I mentioned to his family, now it's odd that he could have been a seaman or he could have been a boatswain mate or he could have been a cook. We could have been sleeping in the same compartment. He could have been above me, he could have been below me, or he could have been sleeping next to me in the bunk on the other side. But during the war and like on the, sh the ships that we were on, it's not like it is in the Navy nowadays. I think my, I come back with my son and all the, he was a hull technician. So all the hull technicians slept in the same compartment. During the war, it was broken up so that if the ship got hit, they didn't lose all the firemen or machinists at one time, or they didn't lose all the cooks or the seamen. So the crews, the crew compartments were always broken up into different groups, and uh, so you were sleeping with people, uh, sleeping around people that you generally didn't work with. Never worked with them. Okay. Maybe no. Maybe you never worked with them. It would be odd if, is I was a water tender. No, it would be odd if I was a water tender and I slept with two or three of the firemen from my same crew, that my same watch. They probably slept into another area where where they weren't with weren't with me at all. I said, and it was the same thing for the deck crew. So if you had the four o'clock watch, and somebody came down to wake you at four a.m. to go on the four a.m. watch, you had to always make sure that they knew where you were sleeping because they didn't wake somebody else up. No, whatever it was. So. But I think now, I don't know how the Navy works. I said, I came back with a, my son from Pearl Harbor on a destroyer tender. And if I recall, he was a hull technician. If I recall, most of the hull technicians all slept in the same area. So it's not like it was in, in World War II. And it was the same thing in the Merchant Marine when I, when I sailed with the, the crews in the Merchant Marine. Although on a three-masted schooner, we we all slept on bunks that folded up, and then uh, that became our mess quarters, and we ate there. And then at night time or in the evening, the bunks came down, and we all slept in there. But you had to get up early in the morning so everybody could have breakfast and chow down. When uh, you were in the Merchant Marine sailing up and down Torpedo Alley, what, I bet, what was that, the feeling like? That was... That was a feeling that, you now, any minute you were going to get torpedoed in, in the alley. That's, well, of course, it was off Cape Hatteras, and uh, I don't remember. That was the graveyard of the ships, but it, it seemed like everybody figured any minute, you now, you could see a ship that would be burning out there, and you'd sail by it and everything. And or you would sail through where all the debris from a tanker or from, most of them, of course, were tankers along the East Coast. 
you would sail through it and you'd figure now that any minute you were going to get torpedoed too. And I was lucky, I said fortunate, and the trips up and down the coast, even when we took the Empire State there, ship was painted a beautiful white and you know, it was the same thing. The war was going on, they were torpedoing the ships, but you often thought, you no, know, are we going to be the next one? But it, it never happened to me. You know, I knew fellows from the Merchant Marine that were torpedoed, and of course some of them that were in the, the section that I were in, in uh, from Hoffman Island, I knew they, they were torpedoed and then they never came back. You know, they were sailing on tankers too. There was so this, pretty high level of anxiety the whole trip? The whole trip all the way down until, well, even after you got past the Florida Keys, then you used to think you were pretty well safe. But then the Germans at that time, or the submarines, I shouldn't say Germans all the time, but the submarines were in the Gulf of Mexico too, so then they started torpedoing them in the Gulf of Mexico. Did you usually go down, was this usually a single ship at a time, or? Well, yes, that's why, until later on, I think after I got off and, and went into the Navy that, uh, I don't, I think they started most of the time that Standard Oil started sailing with convoys and a lot of the con the ship that I was on, the Brilliant, the last time that, I knew that, that sailed from New York and went up to uh, Halifax and I think that got torpedoed up there in Halifax and I don't remember how many of the crew got, uh, was lost onto it, but the ship split in half and uh, they saved the crews from the forward end and they saved a lot of the crew from the, the stern end of it too. But it did get torpedoed after I left it and went up to, uh, in a convoy going to, I presume it was headed for uh, England too, the same as uh, all the rest of them that were going up there. Now, the, the one night that you encountered the submarine, um, were you on deck at that point? I think I was sailing as a seaman on that time. I wasn't sailing. No, that was a motor ship, so there was no fire room onto that. I was sailing as a seaman on that thing. I was off watch. I remember that. But uh, the crew always, well, at, at that time we stood, most of the crew were in the, in the galley, and what they would do if the gun crew needed help, the crew, you no, know, the merchant crew would go out and help the gun crew, but the, I don't recall any of the merchant sailors on to it going out and helping the gun crew. At that time, you know, mm -hmm. there could have been other times that the, the merchant seamen went out and helped the gun crew. So were you aware that this was going on? Oh, yes, yeah, the machine gun bullets were hitting the, the cabins and everything else. Oh, yeah, we were well aware that we were being attacked. Of course, then you knew you were being attacked because the, the Navy gun crew was firing a three-inch or five-inch gun off the stream, so it was a regular gun battle. But uh, I don't recall ever anybody ever getting hurt onto it or getting hit onto it. So the Germans broke it off. They well, yeah, they broke it off when we were going into the. I don't re, don't remember how we got through the net into Charleston. Maybe at that time there was no net into Charleston Harbor, but uh, the skipper sailed it into, the, into Charleston and uh, I presume the, the Navy, uh, the, the submarine just backed off onto it. Never torpedoed us because we were empty at that time, going down empty anyway. With the, they called it ballast, they just had seawater into the, into the oil tanks. Was so uh, <coughs> what did you do after the war? I went back to Standard Oil Company and there was no jobs because it was, the war was over and there was no, no job. I came back home to Ronkonkoma and um, I changed, even though mechanically, I changed my thought and I went into aviation. <laughs> I went to Roosevelt Aviation School. And I guess we were, I was probably one of the first groups that went through there, too. GI Bill? Under the GI Bill, I took advantage of that. I went uh, and I got my A&P license. And uh, 
I came back, of course I was living in Ronkonkoma right here. I lived at home and then I started going with my wife-to-be, which was in Salem, Massachusetts. And of course I knew her through my brother-in-law-to-be, as I said, Jimmy, which we sailed together in the Merchant Marine. And uh, I worked for my father over here in the machine shop for maybe a year or two years. Maybe it was less than the two years. And I finally went to work for Sperry Flight Research, which was at MacArthur Field over here. And I started out as, I don't remember what it was, uh, seeing I had an AMP. I started out, I don't know, as an aircraft mechanic B, and then I went to an A, then I went to a crew chief, and then I went to a flight crew chief. <clears throat> and the flight crew chiefs generally was either on executive transport or they were on demonstration air, aeroplanes. And at that time, Sperry was big into flight research stuff of autopilots and gyroscopes and everything else. And eventually I got put on the executive transport and I sailed, I sailed at that time. Now I, I flew all over the United States and Canada. We used to make what they call the round robin and leave MacArthur Field and go to Detroit. And then from there we'd go to Seattle, Washington and down through the West Coast and back up to Phoenix. Of course, Sperry had plants in all these places and it was one of these things that you took the executives from Phoenix to wherever it was, Florida or whatever it was. We went out, of, they went out of business and of course I left Sperry's and I went to work for uh, Brumman Aircraft and I worked for them until I retired working on everything from the LEN program to the A6s and as I said, no, I mentioned the Mohawk, I worked on them and then the E2C, I ended up working on, on the E2C as major assemblies. We used to build, the, in Plan 3, we used to build a center section and I used to build the nacelles and install the landing gear and all the hydraulics on the E2Cs. Then I went over to the F-14 for a while and I worked in the electronic beam welding area which did the titanium welding in the altitude chambers in Plant 2. And we made the center section and we made the wings out of titanium and they were all welded in altitude chambers in Plant 2. And from there, there was another transfer. You, know, you went from one place to another, wherever I guess they needed you. I was a supervisor there for, I guess, almost the 20 years that I worked for, for Grumman. And then I retired, and I hung around the house for a while. And then I went to work for, on part-time for a place called Lynx. Uh, Link Controls, they were. And eventually they were bought out by Chamberlain from a company from Chicago. And eventually what we made was overhead garage doors operators for commercial, not for the residential. We never made them for the commercial. I worked for them for 14 years as part-time, and I finally retired, and here I am. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty full life. It, yes, it was. I have seven children. Busy life. <laughs> thirteen grandchildren. I think it's thirteen. My wife sees this. She'll probably say, oh, you only had twelve. But I think it was thirteen grandchildren. Three of my boys live up in Lake Placid, and we generally try to make a trip up there twice a year. One boy lives in, uh, in Maryland. He works for the state, I think it's the state of Maryland. He works in, uh, I guess I shouldn't mention that, in a school down there teaching children how to operate uh, computers. Two of the boys, one works for Howard Johnson, the other works for uh, 
Holiday Inn. Both of them, I'd say, worked probably there, probably in there 15 years with them. And uh, the other boy works up there. He works and he teaches bacon and uh, culinary up in uh, Paul Smith's College up in uh, up in Saranac Lake up there. Well, you do? Yes, yeah. I worked for a guy who was the head of the hotel school. Up so. there? Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Small world, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's been up there quite a while, too, since he got out of the Navy, too. He was a Navy fella. He was a cook and baker, and well, he was a baker in the Navy. He sailed on the forest stall. I guess he did four years on the forest stall. He got off it right before the fire on the forest stall when all those fellows got killed on the when that uh, rocket went off or whatever it was. I don't know. He got off it just before the fire. And the other son that works for Holiday Inn, he he was in the Navy too, and of course he sailed out of um, San Diego, the same place I sailed. And he worked, he was on an LST for a while, and then he went on a, a destroyer tender, the Cape Cod. And he was over the the destroyer tenders now, what they do with them. I guess, of course, there are no more destroyer tenders. His is put in the mothball. He, he was over in Japan twice, and uh, he was stationed, the ship was stationed over there. He was over there twice, I think, so he put in his time over in Japan also. Uh, he didn't go to... Uh, Nagoya or Osaka, where I went. He came back now, of course, he's working for the Holiday Inn up in Lake Placid. And my three daughters, one daughter still works for Grumman. She works in Bethpage for Grumman, so she's been there 20 years now, too. One other daughter works for uh, Swiss Air, and the other daughter is, um, she's a uh, I guess you call a substitute teacher for Connecticut High School, uh, Connecticut uh, School District. The other kids, some of them are in college, some of them work part time. No, I guess they don't all work part time. One grandson works for State Farm. The other daughter, granddaughter that I have works for Cleary Oral School. She went to school and got her uh, certificate for. Uh, what do you call it for the hand sign, the sign language? Mm -hmm. That's about it, I guess. Very good. Any questions, Colonel? No. You covered uh, the Merchant Marine in the New York Harbor? Yes. I don't know if I mentioned I never went to a boot camp in the Navy. Yes, you did. I did mention it. Yeah, yeah I never went to that. It plucked you right out and... Yeah. I remember the... As I said, I don't know if he's still on tape or not. Oh, but yeah. I remember giving me a nickel and saying, go take this Staten Island ferry, go over to Pier 6. <laughs> so I just left Pier 18, now I'm going back to Pier 6. But uh, no, never went to boot camp. They often figured how. That was another thing I, I'll mention too now, that it seemed odd in, in the way things are nowadays, uh, maybe I'm wrong on all this, but it, it seems now that everybody's after a title or being up big now. There were all these fellows that we came back out of uh, from the Merchant Marine. Now, we all went into the Merchant Marine, and the majority of my know the same thing as my brother-in-law now. We all had a license, and yet we went into the Navy as ordinary firemen and ordinary seamen. Now, nowadays, I think if, if it was today, I think if I had, which I did in World War II, I had my fireman water tenders paper, I think I would have preferred to gone in and say, I want to be an ensign or I want to be a lieutenant. But for some reason, the rank or rate didn't seem to mean nothing when we all went in in World War II. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe some other fellow will say, hey, this guy is way off his rocker. No, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But I think if you went in today, 
the first thing, if I went down to the Navy and I say, hey, you know, I got my Coast Guard license, I'm a fireman of Waterton, I got my A&P license for the thing, I want to go in, at least I want to be a chief going in. But we all went in those days, and I said, rate didn't seem to mean nothing. Even then, you were in the Navy. I said, no, you could have been in for two years or three years. And you were still sailing out as a fireman. No? The guy didn't care if he made first class or second class or chief. You know? Of course, everybody was after chief, but that was most of the time that was out of the, out of the ranks to make a chief. You, know? you had to put in more than your four years or six years or eight years. But uh, even, even when we were on a ship, you no. Know, Fellas didn't seem to, to care if they stayed there as a fireman or they stayed there as a seaman for the next. They were hoping, though, that the thing, I guess probably that the whole thing was, they were hoping the war would get over and they'd all get out and they'd get back home again. So the rate didn't really mean that much. A lot of them probably figured, I'm not going to stay in that long anyway. But things have changed, I think, now than they were 40 or 50 years ago. Do you have a. Is there you have a particular feeling for your experience? Is there one uh, thought that would sum up your experience during World War II? I, I would say that it, it seems odd that, here's another thing now that people might disagree with you, but I think the experience from then that it's something you can't, nobody can take away from you. Yet, you can go to a place and be with a bunch of people or something, and somebody will always say, good morning, sir, to you. And for some reason, you'll say, why? And they can come up and almost say that you were in the service. I don't know why. don't know how they figure that. But I, I've often come across that, now you'll get that sir all the time. And you just say, no, why, why did you say that? No, I, I think you were in the service. And maybe it rubs off. I really don't know. So um, you saw your service experience as a positive? I, I think it was a positive all the way through, no. I, I can never complain, no, that, as my wife says, no. You did real good, you know. You, you enjoyed life. I says, I enjoyed flying. I enjoyed going all over the country, all over Canada. We used to fly to Newfoundland. I, I had a, on uh, working for Spurry, I was as head on um, executive transport, and I had the run that flew from well, we used to go from here to Teterboro, and then from Teterboro we used to fly to Newfoundland, and that was like a round trip every two weeks or whatever it is. Then we used to fly to Ungava Bay, which is up in northern Quebec, and they used to say, now, how did you ever get that run? I says, I don't know, no, it was one of those things. But I think that all comes from maybe from the Navy and the Merchant Marine experience. Mm -hmm. right. I don't. I don't know, really. I said, I no. I said I've been satisfied with life. I had two good jobs, and it's, I think nowadays it's very odd to have somebody say, "No, that I only had two jobs in my whole life, and that's it." I said, "My, I can talk of my own sons." I said, "One son, every two years, he's changing his job and he's going to another one." And my my uh, daughter's husband, every two years or every three years, he's changing his job. He's going to another one. Sure, I had fifty years, and I only had two jobs. Any final thoughts? No, I appreciate this all. And I hope somebody can come to some use of it. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. Sir. We on tape sure, again? Sure. Sure. We'll just let it run. I. Uh, after the Navy, after I got out of the service, I went back to Standard Oil Company, you know, as I said. Uh, and of course, there was no jobs. There was nobody selling tankers. The merchant fleet was 
all going into mothballs. So I, I, I came home, I lived in Ron excuse me, I lived in Ron Kakamai here, yeah? and then I, I turned around and I figured, well, there's a couple other buddies, and my brother-in-law, he, he was in the same boat, he got out of the army, and he said, gee, what do we do? And I said, I don't know. I said, well, let's go to see what the school situation is, and of course, here we are living in Ron Kakamai, and they were opening up Roosevelt Aviation School in Roosevelt Field. Mm -hmm. That was the old hangars that they had down there. So I said, what the heck, it's not going to cost us nothing. So both of us went, and we went to Roosevelt Aviation. So I think there was a couple other fellows from Patchogue. There was four of us. We used to carpool from Ronkonkoma to, to Mineola. No, no, now there's no expressway, and there's no yeah, thing. You had to go North Country Road, huh? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, the Jericho Turnpike in the winter and whatever it was, wherever you could find the snow ruts, ruts to go through it and everything. We both got our A and P's, and then they came back and I, I said before I, I worked with my father over here, and sometimes things work with your father, but this one didn't work with me. So I had uh, Sperry's had the first hangar over here at McArthur Field. So I knew the, I guess you'd call him production manager, I knew the manager over here very well. And uh, I said, the next opening, you no, know, could you get me in? And of course, at that time with Sperry's and with Plight Research, either somebody had to quit or somebody had to pass away before you filled into the slot. And then you, you had to start at the bottom where, even if the guy was up at the top, you no, know, but the crew chief, he left, you still had to fall into the bottom spot, so everybody else moved up the ladder. So I finally got called, and I went to work for them. And I, I said before, I don't remember if I started as a B mechanic or a C mechanic, and I had to work up, but it, I had my A and P. And uh, at that time, they had three DC-3s, and... Uh, I worked from a, a C mechanic to a B mechanic to an A mechanic, then I went into a crew chief, and finally went into a flight crew chief after, I guess, maybe 10 years with the company. So I finally worked up the ladder all the way through, and um, they were operating C-40, uh, DC-3s, we had four at that time now at our own. And then we had a Navy on, we had two Aero Commanders, and we were operating a Convair C-130B, and we had a B-29, a B-50, and a C-97, and uh, I think we had a C-54 from the Air Force, and a C-47 from the Air Force. So we had a big fleet, and then of course, Lockheed had the big hangar, which was down the end, down the end. Now that's Garrett's hangar. They were in there. And then when Lockheed started to move out, the Sperry now, we built up into a big organization, and we moved into the big hangar down there. And I always think that was the downfall of moving into the big hangar, because from then on, things went the opposite way. We went down the list. but. I, I flew as a flight engineer on a, on a C-131B, and we used to leave from here. We'd go to Hanskin Air Force Base up in Bedford, Massachusetts. Or was, yeah, I guess it's Bedford up there. And I, I was on that for two years, and we used to fly from Hanskin Air Force Base with Raytheon. Raytheon had the contract for the radar into the airplane. We flew from Hanskin Air Force Base out to Dayton, Ohio, round trip, or we'd stay out there with the Air Force operating you know, the radar. I stayed on that for two years, and then when I came back, they put me on the executive transport, which was the, one of the DC-3s. We had two executive transports. I ended up on one of them. And as I said before, we, we used to call it the Round Robin, and uh, we'd leave here, go to Teterboro, and from Teterboro we'd fly to Detroit, 
which, and then from there out to Seattle, Washington, and down the west coast to Phoenix, Arizona, back up to Gainesville, Florida, and back home to MacArthur Field. Some of the times, you know, maybe I'd be gone for a month or two months at a time, you know, we'd be gone. They were all uh, cities where Sperry had had, you know, some kind of business, you know, like Detroit, they had the Vickers uh, company out there, and that was a hydraulics, and that was part of Sperry's too. Mm -hmm. And we'd fly to Phoenix, which was part of Honeywell, and then Honeywell finally bought, I think they took Sperry's over out there in, in Phoenix, Arizona. But I ended up on that flying with them, and then as I said, then we used to fly to Newfoundland in uh, the summer, and then we'd fly to Ungava Bay in the summer, so I had the northern route. I used to fly as co-pilot on most of the trips. And when did you, you left Sperry to go to Drummond? The place folded up. <laughs> I was, well, they started selling the airplanes, they sold one DC-3, and then of course then most of the thing, what the downfall was, they lost their um, Air Force contracts. I think one of them was for the B-29, I can't remember what bomb project that was. And then they took the B-29 back, they took the C-97, and they took all the Air Force smallest took all the aeroplanes back, the, the project smallest. But what year was that? Pardon me? But what year was that? I went to, uh, hadn't been in, in the 30s, 35, 34, something like that. With Sperry? Yeah, I went, I left them, I went, to, I thought I went to Grumman in 39, did I, couldn't have been 39. But you went to Spurry's after the war. Oh, it was after the war, and I'm trying to think. I must have been 49 or 59. I, I, I'm lost on the dates now. I can't remember what the date was. But they folded up. In other words, they lost the, the people got laid off, and we were a union, so you could look up the next week on the bulletin board, you know, and you'd see your name and say, no, hey, you got. So I put in for Grumman, and then I could call to Grumman and go to work with them. That was the only reason I left Sperry, isn't it? But how many years were you with Sperry? I think it was 18 years with them. So, then the, the date is wrong. If I got out of the service at 46, it must have been 20 years, almost figure 20 years, 46, 56, 66. Must have been 67, something like that, or 69 then when I went down with them. But, uh, yeah, they, they just folded up. Uh, Honeywell took us over, I think, mm -hmm. and, and now I hear Honeywell is in trouble. GE is taking them over, too. <laughs> yeah, Burroughs took it over for a while, too. For Spurries? Yeah, Game Unisys. Yeah, they, uh, they, uh, yeah, we sold the aeroplanes. I said we sold, uh, as soon as we sold two aeroplanes, and I knew that the end was coming near. Did you ever get to meet any of the engineers doing testing work out here? I, I worked with, a, in fact, he's he's still over here at MacArthur Field, uh, Spence Kellogg. Did you ever hear of him? I, know I don't him. think so. Huh? You ever hear of a guy named Harold von Hassel? Yes, yes, yeah. I remember him, too. It was my father. Quality? Yeah. Yeah, he was in quality. That was my father. Oh, it was? Mm -hmm. No kidding. Yep. He used to work out at Lake Success Place. Lake Success Place down there. Yeah, he'd come over to Macfield to do uh, testing. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's a small yeah. world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I was out with Spence Kellogg. I said I went I went out with lunch with him, I think, last year. I I went over to him was talking to him over there. I don't know if you, if you ever met him or anything. Well, I think I met him at my father's retirement party. Yeah, he, he's got a little office over there in the old terminal building, and uh, I walked into the office and I thought, gee, Spence, you haven't left it yet, have you? He, he says, no, I'm still working on that flight like the director or whatever it is, he's got these all these little breadboards set up in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Now that was the reason we left them. I says that uh, it wasn't that uh, 